Good morning, Radiant. Man, it's great to see all of you. You look marvelous. Thank you so much for being with us. And we also want to welcome those at our North Campus, our Woodland Park Campus, and all of you watching online. Let's give all of them a great big hand today. A number of years ago, my wife Kelly and I had the opportunity to go to Europe for a church history tour. And we went around and looked at some of the most significant sites in Christianity throughout different countries in Europe. One place where we particularly had a good time was actually a shopping mall. But what made it so unique is that it was a bunch of old buildings that made up this outdoor shopping mall. And of course, here in America, when we think old, we think of a 150-year-old building or maybe 200 years old. But there, we were in four, five, 600-year-old buildings. And the most substantial and significant one was a building that had marble floors. It had these very intricate pillars. It had Gothic construction and beautiful stained glass windows. And we quickly realized that it had been a cathedral. And as we sat there, I couldn't help but think, at one time, this was a place where people discovered amazing grace, where they experienced the love of God. And this was probably a place that was a light to the entire community. And now, it was just a shopping mall. I want you to keep that image in mind as we open our Bibles today to the book of Revelation. Because we have seen in Revelation chapter 1, the resurrected, exalted, glorified Jesus Christ coming to John. And now we're moving into chapter 2 where he is going to talk to the churches. And it's going to be a message for us today. Let's take a look back where we left off last time in chapter 1, verse 19. Jesus tells John, write the things which you've seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. Now, we have seen that that is actually an outline of the entire book of Revelation. The have seen is chapter one, where he experiences the resurrected, exalted Jesus. And then chapter two and three is the are, because it's what's happening right now in the churches. And then finally, what will take place are future events. And that's gonna be Revelation chapter four, to Revelation chapter 22. Now look at verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars. Now we're going to see here that the seven stars refers to the angels or that word angels is literally the Greek word messenger. And most scholars, most commentators believe that's speaking of the messenger in the church the pastor of the church who's now going to communicate this word to his congregation, which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angel of the seven churches and the seven lampstands, which you saw are the seven churches. Now, Jesus is going to be addressing these seven churches in Asia Minor, which today is Western Turkey. And you know, you can still visit the ruins of these cities today. They were in close proximity of each other. They actually followed a circular route that was a postal route. You started in Ephesus and went around to all the other churches and came back to Ephesus. Now, there are some churches not included that were in the Asia Minor area, like Colossae, and Hierapolis, but I believe these specific churches are there for the reason that Jesus Christ is wanting to deal with these issues, not only in that time, but for all of us for all time. That's why he says, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, the churches are depicted as these lampstands. Now, I know for most people when they see that, what may pop in their head is a menorah, the Jewish menorah, but that is not what the lampstands were. This actually could be translated in the Greek language as an oil burning lamp. And this is what it looked like. This is an actual replica. In fact, I know people who have the real deal because there were so many of them. It's how you lit your house. And so when they'll do archaeological digs, they'll find hundreds and hundreds of these things. But what they would do is just take this clay vessel and put oil in it with a wick and through it, they would light their homes at night or their businesses or whatever it may be. And that is symbolizing the church. 
and the church is made up of us. And we are vessels. They were easily broken. We can be easily broken vessels. We seem very common, very ordinary. But in us is oil. And I believe that oil represents the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's why Paul said, we have this treasure, that's the Holy Spirit, in earthen vessels. We're just clay pots. But we have the Holy Spirit that burns through our lives, that ignites our lives, that shows the light of God to the world. And so the church is represented in that way. And what's really interesting is Jesus says not that they're clay, but that they're gold. Because the church is so precious to Jesus. And in that day, gold was the most precious metal they knew. And so Jesus is saying, the church is very precious to me. It is my light in a dark and a hostile world. And again, the angel is speaking of the messenger or the pastor of the church. Now, I know for most people, it'd be very hard to imagine pastors being angels. But you're a radiant church. And a radiant church, you know our pastors. I, I, I at least think of Pastor Kelly. I, I think she looks angelic. Um, <laughs> The reason people are laughing, because we put up on the screens a Photoshop picture of Kelly as an angel. I think she does a great job of looking like an angel. But the seven churches, the number seven speaks of completion. And so you have these angels that Jesus has in his right hand, the stars, the hand of power, the hand of authority, which tells us that a pastor's power and authority comes from Jesus. But more than that, that all power and authority is from Jesus and so really, a pastor is only an under-shepherd to the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ, and someday we're going to have to give an account to him for how we pastored. Now, Ephesus was the first church in this region, and it was the most influential church. It was in the most influential city. In fact, it was probably the fourth most influential city in all of the Roman Empire. It was the fourth largest city. It wasn't the capital of this region, but the Roman governor actually lived there. And they were to be a light of Asia, is how they were known, because of their high tolerance and their supposed enlightenment. They worshiped many gods, including Nero, the emperor, and then later on, Domitian. And so Domitian is being worshiped at that time. It's emperor worship where they would take a pinch of incense to honor and to recognize the emperor. And they considered Domitian a god. Now, the worship of the emperor was common, but what the city was really known for was the worship of Diana, also known as Artemis. Artemis is the Greek name of Diana. And in that city, there was such tolerance for different religions, and there were so many gods that if you said you believed in only one god, that would be considered offensive. But almost everybody worshiped the goddess Artemis that was in Ephesus. In fact, he, she had a huge temple there. It was the first temple ever made completely of marble. And it was exquisite. In fact, it was one of the seven wonders of the world in that day. And Artemis within the temple had a meteorite that they had, a black meteorite, that they said was a statue of Artemis that had fallen from heaven. What really made the temple disturbing to me is that they had temple prostitutes, both male and female that worked there continually. And it was a very despicable religion, especially this form of ritualistic sexual immorality that was rampant there. So much so that other than Corinth, it was probably the most immoral city in all of Asia Minor. It was a significant city though, economically, politically, religiously, but also they were very heavy into the occult. It was an occult center for pagan worship and the occult and witchcraft, which was very rampant. So into that city, the church was birthed 40 years before this is written. And maybe you remember the story. You can see it in Acts chapter 18 and 19. There was a man named Apollos. He was a very eloquent man. And he came into the city and he began to teach and preach everything he knew. And Priscilla and Aquila were a couple who were, had been friends of Paul, and they met Apollos, and they instructed him a little better in the Word of God, but through Apollos' preaching and the ministry and management of Aquila and Priscilla, a small church formed. And then Paul comes to the region. And when Paul comes, these believers are filled with the Holy Spirit, and the church begins to grow and multiply. So much so that they had to find a place to minister every day, and they went to the school of Tyrannus 
where Paul would minister and people would come and it was literally a ministry training center. People would go out from there to other areas of Asia Minor and in fact, all of the seven churches mentioned here, they all started during that revival because it truly was a revival. It was a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit with extraordinary signs, wonders, and miracles to where we read in Acts 19 that God even performed unusual miracles of taking handkerchiefs and aprons out and people were delivered of demonic spirits. It was such a powerful revival that people gathered up their occult books and they burned them to the glory of God. And it was such a powerful move of God that it affected the local economy. So much so that some of the artisans there who made statues to Artemis were not making as much profit. So they started a riot. Well, we know about riots these days and it was horrific. And it set the whole city in an uproar. And a lot of people didn't even know what they were there for. But it was so dramatic that Paul had to leave the city. Later on, he comes back to that region and he comes to Miletus where he gathers all of the Ephesian elders. And as you read it in Acts chapter 20, it's a very moving talk where he talks about how he taught them the entire counsel of God and how much he loved them. And he leaves the area. And he stays essentially the bishop of the church is there, but a man named Timothy becomes the pastor of the church of Ephesus. He's a man that Paul had trained. Timothy later is actually martyred for his faith. And John, who after Paul's death became the essential bishop of that area, becomes the pastor of the church. And if you remember, John would have had Mary, the mother of Jesus, with him. So can you imagine? You have John as the pastor who followed Timothy, who before that it was Paul, and you have Mary, the mother of Jesus, in the church. This was a very significant church, a very important church, a very influential church. And there John wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. In addition, is probably where he was arrested and taken to the Isle of Patmos. So this is the first church that Jesus is going to address. It's a well-known church, well respected church. And so let's read it. Revelation chapter two, beginning in verse one. To the angel, that's the pastor, of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. The golden lampstands are the churches and Jesus is walking in the middle of them. And he is observing what they're doing. He's the invisible observer. And he's critiquing the churches. A lot of people have opinions about the church. There's much criticism of the church today. And some of it's valid. Some of it invalid. Some of it I really couldn't care less about. But I would care very much about what Jesus said. I remember when we lived in San Diego and were pastoring there, there actually was a monthly publication where a man would go out and he would go to the various churches in the city and he would review the churches much like a restaurant critic would review places to eat. And so he would bring back his review and he would say what he thought according to his preferences of the church. And he would even review things like how was the coffee and how were the refreshments. You know, I really didn't care that much what that guy thought of the church but I care very deeply what Jesus thinks about the church. And I feel like the way Jesus critiques churches is much different than how that man critiqued churches. We need to listen to what Jesus has to say. How does Radiant Church line up with the churches in the book of Revelation? How does it line up with the words of Jesus? So in verse two, he goes on to say, I know your works. I think that's so good. Because Jesus didn't say, I know your intentions. Or I even know your thoughts, though those things are important. Or I know your heart, though that's significant. He says, I know your works, which I love because in a time when rhetoric and gestures seem more important than what we do, Jesus is saying, what I'm really concerned about is what are you doing? How are you living? What are your works? And he says, your labor and your patience and that you cannot bear those who are evil. So Jesus sees good things in the church. The church is in a culture that is very antagonistic to their faith. And he says, you're laboring there. And that word labor means to toil to the point of exhaustion. They were working hard. They were working extremely hard at the mission. And then he said, I see your patience. And that carries the meaning 
of endurance under trial. They were in heavy trial. They were under great difficulty. And you know what part of it was? The spiritual influence in the community. We know that because of Paul. In 1 Corinthians, but also in 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 1, Paul talks about how there was such a spiritual battle there that he even despaired of life. That's how hard it was. And so he gave the Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians, instruction on what to do. And he said, you need to put on the whole armor of God because you recognize we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world. We're wrestling against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. There's an invisible war going on, is what Paul was saying. And we too live in a culture that is full of idolatry. Now, we don't worship statue stone and wood images. Instead, we worship things like fame and fortune and achievement and pleasure, and we worship at those altars. I think there's also a tremendous amount of witchcraft and the occult in the day in which we live. I couldn't say that when I was younger, but I have to say it now. Witchcraft is nearly worshiped in our society. It's glamorized in our society. I remember reading more than once over recent years that covens of witches are gathering together, putting curses on the president of the United States. I mean, that's the culture we live in. So it's very similar to what they were dealing with. Look at verse two at the end, he says, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. So there's challenges without, but there's also battles within. Ephesus was a major transportation center. It was a major seaport and there were also highways that went through there where many people came into Ephesus. So they had all these people coming and going all the time. And some of them would come in and say they're Christian ministers. They would say they were apostles. Some of them would probably say they were prophets. And they would have to judge whether they really were. And for a lot of them, the Ephesians said, no, you're not prophets. You're nonprofit organizations. <laughs> okay, I'm doing my best here. <laughs> but they would analyze what they were teaching and what they were doing and discern whether they were really of God or not. And that's important. Jesus talked about that. He said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, that there would be those who were false prophets and they would come in sheep's clothing. So they would look like sheep. They would look like Christians. They would look like followers of Jesus. But he said they were really ravaging wolves. He said, therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Or I think of Paul in Acts chapter 20 when he's talking to the Ephesian elders and he says, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves are gonna come among you and they're not gonna spare the flock. But the Ephesians were very careful to discern what was being said and what was being done. So much so that there's a man named Ignatius of Antioch. And even after this time, they continued this practice because at the beginning of the second century, he said this, there was no heresy among them. And they didn't listen to anyone unless he speaks truthfully about Jesus Christ. Now, this is important to us. Here's why. Because today, a lot of people claim to be apostles, teachers, pastors. Uh, they uh, claim to have uh, a word from God. And many of them aren't Christians at all. Many of them are speaking words that are contrary to the word of God. That's why at Radiant Church, we emphasize to you again and again, everyone in the word every day. Don't fully rely on the leadership of Radiant Church to tell you, you need to know. You need to know the word of God. I think of it, and I've mentioned this before, of how those who try to examine and determine counterfeit money work, they train those people in the FBI by not showing them counterfeit money, but showing them real money. And they get to know the real money so well that when they see a counterfeit dollar a $20 bill say come through that's counterfeit, they immediately recognize it because they know the real deal. And when you know what the word of God says, when you really know the scripture, when this false teaching comes along, you immediately identify it. And that was the Ephesians. They understood that. We go ahead and read in verse three, and you have persevered and you have patience and you have labored, and I love this, 
for my name's sake and have not become weary. Listen to that. They persevered, they were patient, and they labored. And why did they do it? For the glory of God. They did it for the name of Jesus. They weren't doing it to build their own kingdom or their own recognition. They were doing it to glorify Jesus. And I'd imagine at this point, they're feeling very affirmed. I can just imagine some of the Ephesian elders sitting there going, amen, amen. And then they go on to say even more good things about them down in verse six. Let's drop down there. But you have this, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Jesus hated Yes, he hates. Hebrews 1.9 says that Christ has loved righteousness and hated wickedness. God, Jesus, loves people, but he hates evil teaching and practices. And there was a heresy in that day known as the Nicolaitan heresy. And it's very important to know because it's going to come up again when we look at the church of Pergamum and Thyatira. So what was it? Well, we don't know exactly. It's really uncertain, but there's a lot of guesses to what they believe based on various things that we have from the past and what we see in the scripture. It was a short-lived sect. It was a form of idolatry and immorality, but it had a facade of deep spirituality. It really was syncretism, where they would take pagan religions and mix them in with Christianity. And it was a, a license and liberty that said, okay, go ahead and eat meat sacrificed to idols. Go ahead and give a pinch of incense to Caesar. Go ahead and, and participate in the temple orgies that are going on. But you can still be a Christian. Just, just hang on to your Christian faith at the same time. And Jesus says he hates that. He hates that. That's because... Jesus Christ believes in purity and holiness and an uncompromising view of the word of God. And again, I say we have to watch it in these days because there are many who are trying to bring Christianity into the same state of synchronizing other religions and other beliefs in the culture and bring them into Christianity and embrace them. When the word of God says that is not the way of God, that is not the truth. In the middle of darkness, we have to stand for the truth and we have to reject and deny this false doctrine. Now, at this point, you look at this church and you say, it's a poster child for a great church. They're doing everything right. And I'd have to say at Radiant Church, I think we're doing well, just like the Ephesians were. We stand for the word of God. We're not allowing compromise. We're not allowing people in who cause disunity and who bring distraction from what is really most significant and most important. But then we find a fatal flaw to the church in Ephesus. And I think this is a fatal flaw we have to be concerned about as well. Look at verse four. Nevertheless, I have this against you. Okay, here it is. You're a great church. You're amazing. You're doing all these things right. You're very pure when it comes to the word of God. You're vigilant. You're diligent. You have patience and perseverance. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. You've left your first love. You don't have the love for me that you used to have. You're losing your first love. And I think most of us can relate to this on a romantic level. You know, a couple meets, they fall in love, they're crazy about each other, they stare deeply into each other's eyes, they wanna constantly spend time together. But over the years, they begin to take each other for granted. And they, they don't have that first love experience anymore. Reminds me of an older couple that was at a Bronco game. And they were going through the concourse and it was really busy and really crowded. And the husband reaches over, grabs his wife's arm and pulls her close to him. And she says, oh, honey, oh, dear. He, you don't want to lose me, do you? And he said, no, I just don't want to have to look for you. <laughs> and it can be like that in following Jesus, that people really are pursuing a passionate relationship with Jesus Christ, what they're doing is they're wanting to hold on to him enough so that they don't have to look for him when they really need him. And that can happen. We can lose our first love. And usually it's a slow process. It takes time. 
And I think you know what that's like when the romance begins to die. And I know that for some of you, you're trying hard not to show it. But baby, baby, I know it. You lost that love and feeling. Oh, that love and feeling. You lost that love and feeling. Now it's gone, gone, gone. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> hey, believe me, you don't want to encourage this. You don't want to encourage this. But we know what that's like in romance. You lost that loving feeling. It's not like it used to be. And that can be the same in our relationship with God. We've lost that loving feeling. You see, it's possible to serve and sacrifice and suffer for God's name and not really deeply love Jesus. The Ephesians' cool passion for God in their vertical relationship with him also affected the horizontal relationship. They had lost their love for people as well. And remember, that's the most important thing. That's what Jesus told us. Jesus said the most important two commandments are, first of all, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. And then he said to love your neighbor as yourself. But they've lost it. I think it's very easy to perform outward acts of devotion and to serve tirelessly without truly loving people. And a church can fall in love with the way they worship, but out of love with the God that they're supposedly worshiping. A church can fall in love with their programs, but not really love the people that the programs are supposed to serve. And though all of this is important, please realize separation is not a substitute for adoration. And purity is a poor alternative to passion. And labor is never a replacement for love. We have to stay passionate followers of Jesus Christ who love God with all of our heart and we love people. We have to keep that divine fire burning because you can maintain biblical doctrine and carry out Christian duties, but you're not operating in that critical underlying power of the love of God. And I think all of us have known people like that. You know those people that they can dot their doctrinal lies and they can cross their theological T's, but at the same time, they're mean and cruel and unpleasant and unkind. I think we've all met those people. They can have a spiritual smugness. They think they're so right, but they're actually dead wrong. They can know their Bible and they can know all the rules, but they're jerks. And when you're like that, you're not impressing anybody, certainly not Jesus. And the Ephesian church 40 years ago started in a red hot revival where they were on fire for God. And they loved God with all of their heart and they loved people with everything in them. But they're still doing all the right things. They don't just have that same love for Jesus they used to have. And it's not a small matter. It's not a small thing. They're doing good things, but they don't really love Jesus. So what do you do with that? What if that's happened to you? Some of you are saying, that's me. I mean, I feel like I'm just going through the mechanics. I'm just going through the motions. I still come to church. I still read my Bible some, but I don't have that passion for Jesus anymore. I don't really love him. Well, there are three things Jesus says we can do to correct it. We need to remember we need to repent and we need to return. We need to remember, repent, and return. I want you to say that with me. Remember, repent, and return. Because some of us need to do that today. So let's start by talking about remembering. Look at verse five. Jesus says, remember therefore from where you've fallen and do the first works. The NIV says, remember the heights from which you've fallen. Remember your beginnings. Remember your first love. That's the high place from which believers often fall. You know, if a couple wants to rekindle their love, something good to do is remember that time in the past where they were so in love. I remember years ago, I was counseling this couple, and neat couple, but boy, they were having a hard time in their marriage, and they had lost that love and feeling. And so I looked at them and I said, 
Well, what was it that first attracted you to one another? What was it like when you first fell in love? And oh my goodness, the wife's eyes became wide and she began to talk about all the things she loved about her husband and how wonderful it all was. And it began to make a turn in their relationship. It's interesting how that can be. And that's what we need to do. We need to remember what it was like when we first fell in love with Jesus. I think about the Ephesians and they had to remember back and say, well, I remember when I canceled my siesta, instead of taking a nap, I went and I sat under the teaching of the Apostle Paul. I remember when I got out of my comfort zone and I went to another city to share the gospel at the risk of giving up so much just surely for the love of Christ. Or I remember when I took my occult books that I'd spent thousands of dollars on and I just burned it to the glory of God. I remember those high times in God. And some of you need to do that. You need to go back and remember what it was like when you first fell in love with Jesus that it wasn't mechanics, that it wasn't do's and don'ts, but you were deeply in love with Jesus Christ. Remember when you used to think about that bloodstained cross where Jesus took your sin and redeemed you. You remembered the person of Christ who consumed your thoughts. You remember those times when you used to worship God out of a deep adoration and you didn't care what people thought. When you were just absolutely wrecked by God's amazing grace. Because when you really love somebody, you're going to spend time with them. And you remember where you couldn't stay out of God's word. You had to read the Bible. You had to constantly be listening to Christian worship music. You, You couldn't wait to get to church. Those are the times I'm talking about. I remember those times. I remember early on in my Christian walk what it was like. I remember I just couldn't get over the fact that God loved me and that he gave himself for me. I was so thankful for how free I now was in Christ. And I had such a hope in Jesus for all he was going to do in my life. I remember reading my Bible and and as I'm reading it, just going, wow, wow, that's amazing. That's incredible. Wow. I remember having a hard time sleeping on Saturday night because I couldn't wait for church Sunday morning. And here's the thing. When I look back on that church, it wasn't a real great church. But when I went to church, I was worshiping a really great God, and that made it worth it all. Folks, that's first love, and we have to remember what it was like. And then he says, repent. Repent. According to Jesus, the second key to rekindling our first love is to repent, which means this is in a minor deal. (laughs) We're in a deeply dangerous spiritual condition when we've lost our first love. And I know how people think. They think, well, you were a new Christian. You know, that eventually wears off. It shouldn't. That's not what Jesus wants. He wants us to stay red hot, passionate for him. That's the number one priority he has for us. That we have a deep burning love for him. We want to spend time with him. You know, if you love somebody, you spend time with them. And then we spend time with Jesus. We get to know him better, get to know him in a greater way. Listen, if you're faking it, if your prayers start seeming meaningless, if you're more concerned about your worship preferences than the God you're worshiping, if you come to church to be a consumer rather than to be consumed by God, you've lost your first love. And folks, it's serious. You need to make a 180 degree turn and go the other way. Then finally, he says at the end of verse five, do the first works. That's where I get the word return. Go back to what you did in the beginning. So you say, what characterized those early days when I was in love with Jesus? Well, I'd wake up in the morning and he was the first thing I thought about. We'll do it again. I used to have these internal conversations with the Lord all day long. We'll do it again. I used to study my Bible and really expect God to speak to me. We'll do it again. I used to pray and have such faith God was going to answer my prayers. We'll do it again. Don't wait for the feelings. You act and the feelings will come. So go back and do it again. And then he says in verse 5, or else. Or else. That bothers me because my dad used to tell me that. 
I remember when I would get out of line, he would sit down and give me a talk and said, this is what's going to happen now, son, or else. And his or else was never very pleasant. And so I would straighten up. So what's the or else? Here it is. I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Boy, that's serious. Remember the lampstand? Of all the things this church has, the most important thing we have, the thing we need to protect the most is the lampstand. Because if you don't have the lampstand, you don't have anything. It's your influence. It's God's presence in a church. It's God's glory in a church. And if you lose your first love, you lose your lampstand and you don't have anything. I mean, you can sing, you can preach the Bible, you can go through the motions, but Jesus may not be there at all. You've lost your lampstand. There's nothing more critical. There's nothing more important. You got to keep that first love so you can keep your lamp standing. Let me explain something. Churches are known for all kinds of things. Now, I can point out churches that are known for their amazing facilities. I know churches that are known for their enormous size, and there's a lot of those anymore. Uh, some churches are known for their incredible music, and I got this amazing rock band. <laughs> Or they're known for uh, their great preaching. They have this eloquent, powerful preacher uh, who's really funny and dynamic. And, uh, you know, I, I don't care really much about being known for any of those things. What I want to be known for at Radiant Church is that we love Jesus. We are crazy about him. We love him with all our heart. Well, what's, what's that Radiant Church about? They just love Jesus. They're just crazy about him. They're nuts about him. And because they love him, they love people that he loves. That's what we need to be known for. And I think what Jesus is saying is if you lose your first love, I'm not gonna stay in a place where I'm not loved. And they'll lose their lampstand. Look at verse seven. So then he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This isn't just for Ephesus. This is for all seven of those churches. And it's for every church since. He says, to him that overcomes. Okay, what are they supposed to overcome? Because he's gonna say that again and again to the churches. You gotta overcome. Well, what did the church in Ephesus have to overcome? Well, they're in a pagan culture that's antagonistic to their faith. And they're in a place where there's a constant demonic harassment. And they're gonna have to overcome all that and stay faithful to Jesus no matter what. But more than that, what they have to overcome is lovelessness. They got to get the love back. They got to fall in love with Jesus again. And if they can overcome the complacency and the apathy and the lovelessness, well, then there's promises. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, what in heaven's name does that mean? Well, you, you really have to do a little research on that one. One thing I think it means is that in that day, the emperor would always have a garden and that's where he would entertain. And Christians weren't invited to that. And Jesus is saying, but I'm the king of kings and the Lord of lords and you'll be invited to my garden. But even more than that, that day in the temple of Artemis, remember it was one of the seven wonders of the world. It was a key landmark there in Ephesus. They had an amazing garden paradise, just an amazing garden. And in it was a actual tree that was very well known. In fact, it's depicted on some of their coins. And it was said that it was a tree of life. And if you could get to that tree and touch it, if you were a woman with infertility issues, you'd, be, you'd become pregnant. If, if you were somebody who physically was having challenges, if you could touch that tree, you could be healed. And it was the idea that if you were a criminal, it was actually a sanctuary place that if you could go in there, even if you were unrepentant of your crime, if you could just touch that tree, the law couldn't touch you. And Christians couldn't get in there. I mean, it was the temple of Artemis. You don't go there if you're a Christian. And Jesus is saying, wait a minute. I've got a garden paradise for you. And I've got the true tree of life. I've got life more abundantly. I've got true life. 
And if you'll come to me and you'll overcome, you can come to that tree and by faith, you can experience everything that I have for you. Everything that Adam and Eve lost in the original paradise now can be found in Jesus Christ if you'll simply overcome. So that's the message he's giving to this church in Ephesus. There was such a good church. Folks, Radiant Church is a good church. But we don't ever want this fatal flaw where we lose our first love. Now, I think back to that church in Europe that we visited. And I think about that church sometimes. And I think, you know, there was probably a time where their fire was lit and it burned for the glory of God and they were on fire for Jesus and it burned so brightly in that community that people were drawn to that light. The church in Ephesus was like that. Their light burned brightly in the darkness. In a dark world, hostile to their faith, people could find Jesus because they had a lampstand that was burning brightly. Folks, I believe that that's what Jesus wants for every one of his churches. We need to be a light in the darkness. We're called the light of the world. But the key to keeping that flame is our first love. And don't think it can't go out. Don't think it can't go out. Let me tell you some good news about the church in Ephesus. The man I talked about earlier who had written in that second century, Ignatius of Antioch, he said that they took heed to that message and they recovered their first love and they went on to be a dynamic church. However, here's the bad news. Today, if you go to Ephesus and that area, there is no church. In fact, they're not even sure there's any Christians. If there are Christians, they're underground. You can lose your lampstand. Folks, we can't lose our lampstand. If there's one thing we have to be determined to protect, it's the lampstand. And the key to keeping the lampstand according to Jesus is not to lose our first love. Now I'm gonna speak to you because there's some of you, you have lost your first love. Christianity has become mechanical to you. God's word has become rote to you. And I'm gonna tell you, nobody's exempt from this. I can go to the scripture and I can read it and just say, oh, you know, I've been there before. I've read this before. I, yeah, I know that. I know that. I know that. I know that. I, I need to prepare a sermon so I better get into the scripture. Or I can open the Bible and say, Jesus, speak to me today. I can go out in my everyday walk and I can just get involved with every other thing or else I can say, Jesus, I want to follow you today. I want to talk to you today. I want to fellowship with you today. I can come into a building like this and the music can start and I can lift my hands and my mind's thinking about all kinds of other things. Or I can say, Jesus, I'm just here to honor you and I love you and I, I want to serve you and I want to give you everything. Jesus, I love you so much. And folks, you can do it. Hebrews says, follow those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Folks, you can do it. Follow those who do it. Find somebody who loves Jesus. Do what they're doing. If you've lost your first love, remember what it was like and do what you used to do. But whatever you do, don't lose your first love. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for everyone in this auditorium. I pray for Radiant Church today, all of our campuses. I pray for those watching online. Lord God, please help us to protect that candlestick. Please help us to protect, protect that lampstand. May it burn brightly at Radiant Church. May we not let it go out. Father, I know in Ephesus, it was another generation where the lampstand was beginning to go out. Lord, I pray that we would not allow our generation or the generation to come to lose the fire that burns for Jesus no matter how many distractions there are, no matter how antagonistic to our faith this culture is, no matter what kind of circumstances we face, 
or how much complacency or the cares of life or the deceitfulness of riches or anything else weighs us down, we will not lose our first love. Father, I pray that every one of us would make that determination today. And we say, Lord Jesus, baptize us afresh in your love. Give us a fresh love, a fresh fire for you. And Father, I pray that for everyone here, everyone listening on radio, everyone under the sound of my voice at every campus and online, Lord, let us not lose our first love. In Jesus' name, amen.